and welcome to Slayer Fest 98. I'm your host, Ian Carlos Crawford, and joining me is my wonderful co-host, the author of the Buffy Slayer duology, the And I Darken trilogy, and about a zillion other books. Kirsten White. Hi, Kirsten. It's been a while. It has been. I know. I, I realized because my Hulu was still on like seven or ten episodes ago. So yeah, I think it might have been conversations with dead people. Yes, yeah, it's been it's been a while. <laughs> Season seven yeah. feels long anyway. Um, yes, <laughs> and it feels like it's been a long time. We are going today with two amazing guests. The first is the creator of Demon Hunter, a queer horror comedy series. Tim O'Leary. Hi, Tim. Yay! Hi, hi Tim. And Hello. our second is writer, editor, and soon to be Slayer Fast ninety eight co host. When we get to Angel. Ryan Houlihan. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Uh, so here we are. Kirsten, you're back. Kirsten and Ryan, you're both back like Faith. That's what Adam kept saying when he co-hosted the last episode. Um, <laughs> you're both back to light a fire under my ass. Uh, but Tim, you you here are our final Buffy guest to give a Buffy origin, because after this, it's all returning. Yes. Um, I'm the Caleb. I just pop up yeah. out of nowhere at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> so give us your Buffy origin. Oh man. So uh Buffy was the absolute most formative show that I uh watched as a as a as a teen. And I'll never forget I was a huge fan of the movie. Uh and then I, I kept reading on TV Guide that it was getting turned into a TV show. And I was in rehearsals for my high school production of Hello Dolly, and we were all a buzz <laughs> because it was gonna be premiering that I think it was Monday nights when it started. And so, um, so we all watched it and it was just, it was huge. And then I remember the second season when the fandom really took off, there was this, like this thing where every day in chorus class, we would talk about the episode that premiered the last night. So it's like Buffy is so wrapped up in my high school experience, which is, you know, relevant because Buffy was of course in its beginning, a show about high school. And yeah. <laughs> uh, then when a lot of a queer element of my life started to take place, it was also coincided with when Willow came out. So it was Buffy was just a show that was at the perfect formative time for my, you know, progression in life. And so for that reason, I'll always love it. And it's inspired me in all of my writing. And now I live in LA. We were talking uh, before about how LA is a terrible place to live. <laughs> I live here now. Uh, as Angel will tell you, it can be a terrible place to live. Uh, but um, it really is the show that made me want to get into filmmaking and screenwriting and stuff. So that's what that's what brought me here. You know, I the first time we had Jana Spencer on, I told her I was like, just so you know, like so many queer people like be, wanted to become writers because of this show. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know. Uh, so many and like you know I, I have so many like you know i'm a writer but like kirsten is a published author and like i have so many published authors on and like i feel like a lot of y'all kirsten like will say that buffy did help inspire you right yeah yeah i mean it was hugely formative it was formative yeah. to how i write humor and how i write group dynamics and the types of stories that i want to tell like yeah i agree so many of us who were exposed to this as teenagers it just kind of wrote itself onto our storyteller dna yeah yeah well said um, and i yeah. i i always i i would always say that like buffy spoiled me because anytime i went into like horror or like supernatural any kind of like show i wanted it to have both the like humor and heartbreak like i always wanted a balance of both with mm -hmm. like oh a scene where i can laugh out loud and then the next scene i can be crying is mm -hmm. like always what i'm looking for and you know we didn't always uh quite get that with a lot of the buffy the shows that came after that were trying to repeat the formula didn't always quite like I it. always say that, like, I would have found something to latch my personality onto, like Charmed <laughs> or something. But And no offense to Charmed. Uh, no offense. I talk shit about it every time I'm on. But it's because I know for a fact that would have been my entire personality. But thankfully, I'm a really good writer now because it was Buffy instead. <laughs> I agree. I think if Buffy had not existed but Charm had, I would have been very much a Charm head. Whereas now, every time I watched it, I was always just disappointed that it wasn't the Scooby gang that was in action. 100 adventures. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Ryan, you really do bring up Charmed every time you're on Every time, every time. Because it, it is, it's the perfect example of something that, like, we all get 
what the difference between <laughs> Buffy and Charmed is, even if I can't put it into words <laughs> in less than like two hours. <laughs> I think it's just, can you just say it's the intelligence, right? The intelligence. Of <laughs> yeah, the 100%. Writing. That's yeah. a huge element of it. Which yeah. is funny because both of those shows were like my mom's favorite shows when they were on. <laughs> I like, I mean, I've told the story a million times, but like I would always be like, oh, those shows. And then eventually I was like, oh, wait, this show? I love the show. <laughs> my I best my friend growing up who did not come out until we were like 30 told when i was growing up i was like you should watch buffy every single week the show <laughs> was on and he watched charmed instead and when we and he was like i can't get into buffy i don't know about that that's like i was like are you fucking kidding me and then he came out at 30 and he watched the episode and he was like that show's pretty good i was like i'm gonna fucking kill you oh my god <laughs> <laughs> 30 years of this <laughs> yeah i i don't remember if it was my 18th or 19th birthday that the episode potential aired exactly on my birthday but mm. literally my plans with my friends were we're going to sit in my room and watch Buffy we're going to get dinner and then we're going to go home and watch <laughs> Buffy together and none of them were Buffy fans but everyone was like alright sure and we watched because it was like I was so excited that there was an episode airing on my birthday <laughs> <laughs> it was just for you <laughs> just for me yeah but anyway so we are here very close to the end of the season um, we're here to talk about Touched an episode mm. that I and I, I, you guys probably agree. I do feel like at the end here, I remember, it's like, I remember Dirty Girls and I remember Chosen, but the stuff that happens between, I get a little bit, like in my brain when we were planning these out, I remember when I was talking to Adam and Kirsten about it, I kept being like, I think this is the episode where, the, like, Adam was like, oh, Empty Places, that's where Buffy's already been kicked out. And I was like, I'm not sure, but it's like, no, she's going to get kicked out till the end of Empty Places. Mm -hmm. Um so the previous episode ended on a beat that still makes me furious nearly 20 years later, <laughs> kicked Buffy out of the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kirsten, what do we open on? We open on so, so many people in one room. <laughs> Just bodies, wall to wall. Oh my goodness. Um, and I think the reason why they're, why you feel that way is this, this grouping of episodes almost feels like one continuous episode, right? Yeah, because yeah. we tend to pick up immediately where the previous one left off. So in this one, we pick up with all of the potentials and faith and basically everyone who has absolutely betrayed Buffy um, mm -hmm. arguing about what to do next. Yep. And like, <sighs> I, it's weird because I think it's, you know, clearly they know that it's a scene with a lot of people because even the camera, mm -hmm. like the camera work is shaky. Like it, it'll like pan. Yeah, right? I don't know if they did that because they didn't want you to ever be able to focus on any of the <laughs> extras where you'd be like, I am almost positive she's never been here before. Um, <laughs> like I, I, I genuinely had that thought. I thought, I wonder if they do this type of camera work to give the impression of a lot of people, but not allow you to focus on any of the ones except for the people who matter. That it's true sense. that there's a lot of people who like potentials wise where they like really, they chose three actors and shoved them to the front of the group. And they're like, all right. So while they're talking, just move a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The part of it that really like the, the part of this scene that bothers me the absolute most is because it's supposed to take place from the second that the last episode drops off is that, mm -hmm. um, be, you know, between Buffy walking out the door and then the camera coming back, Anya was able to get a full curl style to her hair, just completely different, completely <laughs> different hair model. Well, she what does. they don't tell you is that at the magic box, she has this really magical wig. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she actually does have that hair at the just for the final scene in does that she? previous I episode. Was, I thought it was straight in the final scene, and then the, then they curl it. I, I own, the only reason I remember this is because I like because of um, the screenshots I tweet from Slayer Vest. So like I, when she says like, you're just luckier, she has the straight hair. Yeah. But I do remember Emma Caulfield writing something for Entertainment Weekly for the 20, 20th anniversary and saying that she would get in trouble because she would change her hair so often that it would sometimes interfere with continuity because she'd just suddenly have a new hairstyle in the morning. Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, she did. She And hair color too. She was yeah. really willy-nilly with how she changed her hair. but Especially yeah. like, in a town that's supposed to be evacuated, like where are we where are we getting our hair done? Right. <laughs> I don't know. I put nothing past a group of twenty two year olds or whatever they're True. supposed to be to yeah. do some fucked up shit to their hair overnight. And to oh, be fair, true. like whenever I do those videos with like Zach or Alistair, because they like Zach co-hosts uh, podcasts often, uh, they do like a lot of video content, and I'm always like, I need an hour to be ready before I am filming anything. Like I need to wash my face. I need to do my hair. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I probably would also be that person that during the apocalypse is like, well, I got to look cute. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I would be Andrew who's like, I need to urinate. <laughs> <Please>. yeah. <laughs> I'm pre- like, I, oh my God. Like, I would want to be Faith, but I would be Andrew. <laughs> if I'm being honest with myself. <laughs> Andrew survives, baby. It does. It does. It's true. Um, and like, you know, I, I, I like the, we get a couple of good lines here. Like Anya has the really good line at like death knocking at their door, like maniacal, maniacal Girl Scouts and Amanda being cute and like discussing a method on how to discuss. And like Faith is just like, frankly, our situation blows. Yeah, um, but I love Faith's, um, we're wicked stressed. Like I'm wicked stressed. Like, uh, okay. Um, but yeah, like our situation blows. Um, and I, I call her Millie. Um, her name is Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right, so Actress's Amanda, name is yeah, Millie. Though, right? Like it's cute, and it shows that they they really did not have a plan. They have no idea what they're doing, and it's all just sort of that frantic. What do we do now? Which then cuts to Buffy's walk of shame. <laughs> uh, Kirsten, you you have written this verse. You 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 are a well published author. Explain to me what you think they were thinking by having Buffy get kicked out of her own house this close to the end. I mean, I think they needed to have a lot of dramatic conversations. Mm. And the best way to do that was to separate everyone. Like, honestly, like, I don't feel like it makes sense for, I felt like it made sense for the potentials and even Faith to kick Buffy out. But, and you know what? Maybe even Dawn, I say, as as a... (laughs) woman with an older sister who was always in the spotlight um (laughs) but but for willow and xander and giles to do it does not track that was very much a we need this this circumstance of events to happen and this is the way to make it happen so like yeah i mean they did come off of such a dramatic fight where there were deaths and xander was horribly injured yeah. um and so there there is that heightened level of emotion but at the same time it very much smacks of the here is the plot it's gonna <laughs> happen yeah. move on um yeah, yeah. so Agreed. you know i, I actually Listen. don't have a problem with it because i do really love this episode and i love the moments that this scenario yes. is able to create so i'm okay with giving them a pass <laughs> Listen, I always say Buffy is my Jesus story, and I do believe that at the end there, someone had to be like, you said 30 pieces of silver, eh? Um, (laughs) And I I think, like, it's good, too, because it's like, Buffy and everyone, I know that it doesn't make sense at this point in the show, because they've been through so much where, like, magically, like, the universe has been like, Buffy is special, or whatever, with, like, giant glitter writing in the sky, but... (laughs) I do think at the end there, they, there needed to be some like reckoning with the fact that is she just lucky and like yeah. have have like her friends have helped her out, but like have they carried her and like what makes Buffy special in any capacity besides the fact that she has superpowers and like even if that's true, like I, I mean it, it goes with the whole glory thing of like oh who doesn't <laughs> like everybody's got super strength what are you bringing to the table and it, it is it's about being chosen and I think it's a good. For me, it's a good um, meditation on the idea of being chosen. And I think, you know, also as a Jew, it's a similar thing of like, well, chosen for what by who? (laughs) I don't know. Like, I don't know what you're making me do here. Um, But I I do think it's a it's 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 a good way to point out that, like, it doesn't have to mean good. It doesn't have to mean bad. It doesn't have to mean your life is easy. It doesn't mean that your life is going to be hard. It just means you were chosen. And like, it's you, you were the special one. I, unfortunately you were the one who's learned the most and did the most. And if anybody's going to win, it's going to be you. And that's the way that it is. And, and it doesn't mean you're always going to have the answers. It doesn't mean you're, you're perfect. It doesn't mean, you know what I mean? Like everybody had to around the house be like, Oh shit. She's still a deeply flawed person and a young woman. Um, but it it is going to be her. And like, even faith, who has all the same stuff, it can't be her because Faith made the wrong choices and Faith hasn't been in the game. Faith hasn't learned how to help people correctly and hasn't learned like how to make hard choices um, the way that Buffy has. She's learned her in her own path. Um, yeah. And Faith definitely has a lot of life experience and wisdom and, and I, I nobody wants to discount that. She's like one of my favorite characters. But it, it it's different than leading a group of people 
to have to do the right thing repeatedly over and over and over for years. Like, like Spike said, she died for you people. Even if Faith has a point, Mm -hmm. she died for you and you kicked her out of her own house. Mm -hmm. Like, pick your shit up and go somewhere else. What are we talking about? (laughs) Her mother paid for this mortgage, you bitch. That that is like, that's the the biggest travesty of that whole thing. It's like, you have to leave. She's like, of anybody who deserves to be in this house, it's me. All (laughs) you other motherfuckers can leave. Because she was chosen. She's... Joyce's daughter it's her (laughs) house she did the thing she was chosen it just is what it is and I do think that that's okay for the show to say like some things are what they are you know what I mean absolutely but the thing that I always took issue with is when Anya says that you know it doesn't make you better than us it makes you luckier than us it's like is Buffy luckier than you guys like she's been put into you know danger since she was 15 years old and Buffy never wanted it especially in the beginning I don't think she would ever say I'm luckier than you right Mm -hmm. yeah if you're getting mugged in an alley it helps to have super strength but beyond that it's a pretty shitty deal I mean Buffy and Faith (laughs) say at some point like the redeeming quality is we're hot chicks with superpowers (laughs) right but like that's the presence the, the that the, that's the premise is that of that joke is that like everything in our lives is awful <laughs> yeah except we happen to be hot chicks with superpowers right but everything else sucks yeah, yeah. which by the way yeah. i would take being a hot chick with superpowers even with everything else sucking because i would love to be a hot chick with superpowers just put that totally. out there. yeah <laughs> Uh, the mark of a gay man, right? Yes, yes indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we get, uh, she, oh wait, so first we do get, I do love that Vi is like, everything will be better in the morning after Faith says they should go to bed and then the power cuts out and it's just everyone screaming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that part. <laughs> and yeah, so then we we get Buffy and she confronts a man who like immediately has a gun and I, I, I love this Buffy, this version of depressed Buffy would have worked so much more for me in season six because I love that she's depressed but still kind of confident, right? Yeah. She's still like, no, and she just takes the gun and is like, you probably should leave. Yeah. And she doesn't mm-hmm. mean like, I'm taking over your house. She means like, there is an apocalypse happening. You should probably leave the town. You've lived here for how long? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sometimes you gotta get out of town. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is nice seeing that sometimes the residents of Sunnydale have sense, right? Like, right, yes. You right. packing up, you see people leaving. Yeah. yeah. I was like, if you live in Sunnydale your whole life and you don't, you can't tell the signs of an apocalypse, that's kind of on you at that point. <laughs> right? That's a you problem. Yeah. I love that he had a gun too, because it, to me, it said very much like to the, you know, gun and country militia crowd who like is around this nation stockpiling, you know, yeah. 45 caliber bullets or whatever. It's like, I don't know what you think you're up to, but we're talking about like arcane forces of the economy and world. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't think that that's going to help you, bud. And I yeah. do enjoy that, like Buffy and the metaphor of it all was like, even a man who owns his house and is like, this is my land with his gun or whatever. She's like, oh, okay, we're talking about things way over your head. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, I love uh-huh. the delivery of this scene too, because she's yes. almost haunted, right? The way that she's talking, it's not your house, not your town, not anymore. And then she goes to the fridge and says, got any tab? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> and like it works so, so well, right? It's like in one one moment it's it's haunting and it's sad and it's and then the next it's funny. Sarah Michelle Geller has the range. He does. Uh, he does. Yeah. And that, it's something you really appreciate when you get older is what good work she did in that role. Because yeah. you take everything mm. for granted when you're a kid watching it, but damn, right. she is so good in that role. I it's mean, air, airlift her to the Emmys, please. I <laughs> yeah. don't know what is going on. <laughs> and she carried that entire show on her back for seven years yeah. and, did, yeah. and and never did a bad performance, except in season four when she tried to punch something one time when she was walking with Oz, and it didn't look like she was punching anything. <laughs> Listen, I didn't love beer bad, but we all had a tough summer that year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to blame her. That that was its she own. Commits. She, she still commits. commits to the role. She um, commits, right. But okay, so yeah, then post-credits, we get uh, Spike and Andrew coming ho- Or No, they're not coming home. They're in, in the, the, crypt. the crypt monastery, wherever well, they are. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you did have, raise a few questions for me? Because I'm like, well, they rode there on a motorcycle, but they're in a different time zone? Because isn't it night in Sunnydale? Um, oh, that's yeah. a really good point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. I, I mean, granted, it could just be edited. Because, like, where are you driving on a motorcycle that far that, it, like, it's daytime when it's nighttime where you came? You know, between well, that, the first. While it's still night. But, I, I, yeah, because that's the thing. That's what bothers me is that also we were talking about, like, Anya having a change of hair and stuff. Is that from 
the opening before the credit scene in the when they're all having that like big argument. And then when we see them in the basement, presumably where they went right after the power went out, everyone's in different outfits. Everyone has different hair. But right. Buffy is still in the same house in the same outfit. So I mean, does like if to you're go depressed, catatonic. that tracks. What you that? say, If you're depressed, that tracks. True. You're not leaving okay. your house and you're not changing your outfit. Yeah. <laughs> that, yes. <laughs> so, but I do these, I think Andrew <laughs> Is like I, I know that Jana Benson told me when she was uh, did a brief outro for a storyteller that like they definitely did they like Andrew was supposed to be the leader of the trio, but then they liked Tom Lank's audition so much that they started making the character more like Tom Lank, and he just worked so well as that gay guy. Like I am this gay guy where it's like I'm anxious, so I'm not going to shut the fuck up. So I'm going to keep. <laughs> talking because mm-hmm. the silence is making me more anxious right. <laughs> right. he's so good i mean and and he's funny with anyone you pair him he's yes funny with anya he's funny with spike he's funny like he plays well off of everyone That's yeah. a good so, like, point. i yeah. mean continuity aside i liked the scene i thought yes. it was funny um yeah. and it was nice to have spike's concern he just wants to get back to buffy and help her contrasted with the next scene, which is Anya giving everybody a pop pep talk, which you know I, I kind of want an Anya pep talk. Like no matter what happens, it's it's going to be bad, um, probably worse than you're thinking, and it won't matter because you'll be dead at the end. Like thanks. <laughs> oh, and that's such sad, like you know, foreshadowing for her own fate. I know because Amanda does die. Yeah, um, that really like, killed me when Amanda died. That for some reason that one really that stung. Like it stung when everyone who died, died, but, like, I don't know why Amanda's so, death really hurt. Tim, I I can remember, I I fully remember, I was so busy crying over Anya that, like, I couldn't concentrate on anything else. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, that's, um, that's fair. Yeah, fair but enough. But no, she's, she's definitely the potential that, like, I mean, Kennedy gets the most screen time and gets a little bit of, like, uh, get to be in the front, mm-hmm. but yeah. Amanda's definitely the potential that feels the most like a Buffyverse character, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And if Kennedy, um, if Kennedy had died, I would have been like, eh. No, like, I wouldn't oh, have, I, would have another dead girlfriend. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I just think Willow needs to get on Hinge or something. I'm not <laughs> loving this Kennedy of it all. At no point, I mean, every time I return to these final episodes, I'm like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, <laughs> I like, know. You got like, a lot to say for someone who missed all the action. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. And I, it's like, and it's not the actress's fault. I think she's fine. It's no. just, yeah. it, uh, there's just something about that character. And even she even self identifies as a brat, but like, there's so ugh, I don't know. There's something about her that grates on me, and it could just—it's well, so not, I it's not as cute as as people who self-identify as brats think that it is. <laughs> That's a very very good point. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah, when somebody comes in, they're like, "I'm a bitch." You're like, "Well, all right, <laughs> cool, all right, you. so go." Yeah, <laughs> listen, I I've had this conversation every episode this season. I will defend Kennedy only because I don't think she's as bad. Like, she's not my favorite, but I don't. I think she's fine. No. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think sometimes people get a little too precious with their couples. And I, yeah, I feel like they forget that, like, it's the end of the world. Kennedy's a hot young top that wants to, like, hook up with Willow. Who whom st- would be like, no, thank you. I'd like to stay celibate during the apocalypse. Who among us? Truly. <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> that's a, that's um, a good point. That's, a, that's, that's definitely valid, yeah. And... And I get it. It's because people love Tara, and I, of course, love Tara way more than I love Kennedy. But I just think there's, like, nothing wrong with, like, you know, they don't say I love you. And so, for me, like, a lot of people say it's forced, but I don't think it's forced because they don't say I love you. So I'm fine with it being, like, oh, I'm attracted to you. I'm attracted to you, too. And, like, that being all, like, that's fine. I guess guess the reason I don't like Kennedy is that I feel like there's a lot of... um, uh, the queer dynamics on the show are interesting. And I think the reason that Andrew's so funny with everybody and it feels so fresh whenever he's on screen is because there just hadn't been a ton of characters like that interacting with other characters on shows. Yeah. Um, and certainly these, these characters, we've seen them in every iteration of sort of, you know, Willow's openly gay, but other than that, we're not seeing like, like a lot of the, the, a lot of the dynamics that come into play when it's like a feminine man are not present for the run of the show. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if they are, they're like made a joke of, Um, but he takes himself seriously and he, um, 
the Tom Blank in particular is really committed to giving the character like three dimensions mm-hmm. and dignity and stuff. Yeah. And I think the reason I don't love Kennedy is that she comes into the group and I know that this is unfair and this is me bringing my stuff, but she <laughs> comes into the group with like a very straight guy energy where like there's this assumption that everybody is ridiculous and silly and not worth taking seriously besides her. And I hate that energy. Like, I really don't <laughs> like that she comes in and disregards people. It's like, Oh, actually I don't need you talking shit about Andrew. Cause he's done some shit. You don't even understand. Right yet. So let's <laughs> right. shut the fuck up. No superpowers. You know what I mean? Like I get really annoyed really fast with her, but I, I do know that part of that is that I just am scared of middle school boys. so we get and like they're arguing more um you know like kirsten mentioned we get that anya pep talk that's like not a pep talk um kennedy is here this is where this is what i like kennedy is being pushy but willow says honey you're being a little pushy like willow's even like relax Mm -hmm. um and Kirsten, I wanted, Faith even says, look, I'm not Buffy, but the potentials are getting mad because she is just now formulating a plan for them to go into a battle again. What do you think about that writing? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like Faith Faith is like, yeah. okay, well, I'm the Slayer now, so I'm going to step into the lead. And all the potentials being like, didn't we just resolve this situation where we were being led by a Slayer and said, we don't like this anymore. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's a bunch of scared, scared, like, teenagers. So yeah. I, I think, you know, I think it makes sense. I just, I really like this episode. I like looking at everyone in it. Faith is so beautiful. She oh is. Oh, so beautiful. My God, she I, is. I like yeah. seeing her try to step into a leadership role. I think it's really an interesting um, choice. And it's, it's interesting to see it play out. Um, cause you can see her asking herself, what would Buffy yeah. do? And hating that she has to ask herself, what would Buffy do? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, like, I mean, yeah, on the one hand, they just got back from a disastrous plan made by their leader. And now they have a new leader who is like, let's make a plan. Um, but you know, what else are they going to do? <laughs> I, I think it's interesting because of the, like, politics of it all at the time. Like, I understand that there's a lot of controversy about this, but I do think that there's a lot of Iraq war stuff going yeah. on in this season. And to me, it is interesting to be like, okay, we have a power vacuum. What could fill it? Let's do the exact same thing and hope for different results. Yeah. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that. Wow. I, I do think it's tough to be like, Okay, like we we've overthrown Buffy because we don't like like I don't love I don't love that the show is like we've overthrown Buffy because we don't like the way that the world is or the way that like the circumstances are and we're blaming her for the circumstances because we need somebody to blame and she's the one bringing it to our attention and like making us do stuff about it. Um but once you overthrow her, it's like you the show I think is seemingly saying, well, that's just reality. So if you want to stick someone less able to deal with the situation and go right ahead, but either way, there's going to be someone that has to lead. I don't know that that's necessarily true. And I don't know that I necessarily agree with the show's conclusions, but I do think that that's what it's trying to say is like, Mm -hmm. is like (laughs) you can imitate Buffy, but you'll never be her. And there has to be a like leader and we have to have a champion and we have to have like a figurehead who has power. And I don't know that that's true, but I do think that's what the show believes. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That is, that is that. quite a read of the text. I never even thought about it in, in those terms. But uh, I mean, you like, needed to live with my father, who was a weirdo <laughs> <laughs> Republican during the Bush administration. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's so wild. They, they have the idea of the idea is that they're going to like capture a bringer, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't that what they like decide? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was funny when they're listing all the bads, though. They're like, well, he's untouchable. Well, we literally can't touch him. Well, <laughs> <we're> <laughs> <hungers."> <laughs> So we get a little uh, Caleb and the first as Buffy scene. They're watching the bringers cut into some big stone, which we know is the scythe. Um, uh, Caleb, I almost said Kirsten insists Buffy and her gang won't get it. Caleb, and- <laughs> I also insist it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of you, all of you are writers. I did we all? I know Kirsten, you did. Just as we've talked about this, did Ryan and Tim? Did you guys read uh, Frey? Yes, yeah. I did. So I was very excited when you know spoilers when when right. the uh, scythe pops up at the end because I had read the comic. 
And so yeah. I was I was like that Leonardo DiCaprio gif of like, oh, oh you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. pointing at the TV. Yeah. yeah. I think I was on vacation in Fort no, not Fort Lauderdale, in Key West with my parents. And I threw a fit because I wanted to go watch this episode. And my parents wanted us to all go out to dinner on vacation together. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not fucking doing that. So they ordered food to the hotel, like the like villa or whatever we were staying at. And I sat in the side bedroom and watched the episode of Buffy. And my dad, I could hear him just like muttering and complaining about me being there. But when the scythe popped up, I screamed and was so happy and was running around. I was like, yes! <laughs> and I was like, where's the internet? How do I get on the internet? <laughs> and my parents parents were like well i guess that was worth it for him <laughs> and the, right the, <laughs> the size popping up to me will always be tied to a memory of just being like i don't know just pure joy it made yeah. me really happy i it's the why i love buffy is the all the interconnecting details and like if you get the references great but if you don't they're also still going to explain what the world without yes. shrimp is you know what yeah. i mean yeah. and i love that that's it makes it feel so lived in it's i really need that in my like genre worlds so then, i was happy when it showed up and i knew what it meant and i was so excited and this i because it had been so long since i'd seen this episode i thought that the opening of the next episode was included in this one with the scythe but yeah, yeah. Spoiler, but when when he's like when caleb's like oh you're not gonna be able to pull that out of the stone and she does which is of course an arthurian moment <laughs> right yeah and it's just one of those things where it's like that's where the mythos of buffy started to feel like it was more ancient than it mm-hmm. had ever been in the in the series so far. So yes. yeah, I mean it's just everything about the like they really they they stuck that landing with that one with yeah. the side reveal. It was a yeah. great idea for them too to be like there is so much lore and there's so many legendary things you don't even know about. Seven years, psh, you should give us three spin-offs. <laughs> right. I'm still I'm still bitter that Faith on a motorcycle never happened. I'm so yeah, so so bitter. Faith in that. Vegas. But yeah. Kirsten, I want to hear I want to hear your take on this. Yeah, I'm gonna disagree. Um, because <laughs> I did not read Frey until after I had seen the whole series. I didn't mm. really know that there were Buffy comics. Um, and so for me, I I literally call it in my notes the Deuce Axe Machina. Like <laughs> it, it, feels so, it feels so random. It feels so just sort of like shoehorned in at the very end. Oh, by the way, there's been this mystic weapon tied to the Slayers this whole time that we never once mentioned in seven seasons. Also, there's this whole secret society of women watching over you. You've literally never seen them or heard about them or know about them, and you'll never see them again. But they were there. (laughs) Like, that to me, as a writer who has written series and has not had series planned out all the way to the end and gotten to the end and was like, oh, shoot. That's what that feels like to me. Um, Mm -hmm. So it is nice when you know that, like, yeah, it it, it was connecting, but that's the problem when you're working in multiple forms is you can't count on people having access to all the ways that you're telling the story. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I actually don't love the scythe. Um, I can't remember. Did they ever explain why, like, Giles had never mentioned the scythe? Did they say that it was, like, kind of hidden from the text or anything? Or It was, like, lost to history or something, <laughs> which is, like, a throwaway line. Okay, got it. All right. <laughs> well, okay, so I'm also, no, no shock here, Kirsten. I'm going to agree with Kirsten because... I can remember, like, at the time, I was very excited, same, because I was like, oh my god, that's the thing in Frey, like, blah, yeah. blah, blah, that's so cool, but I just wish that we had gotten, maybe Giles mentioned it, if, if there had been, like, one or two mentions earlier in an early season that, like, mm-hmm. you know, the original Slayer used to have a weapon, or, like, you know, the first three Slayers had this weapon, and then it was lost forever, or maybe just like a picture of it when we saw the other Slayers or something. I, I do wish because I love Frey, and I think Frey is like one of the best like Buffy verse comic stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agreed. It's like top to bottom a very great story, um, and I think Kirsten and I have been talking about doing a podcast episode on it for three years now, um, <laughs> but. I, and I do think it's great. Um, I just wish the scythe would have been mentioned earlier. Yeah. Or we had we knew, like, even if they had said early in season seven, if Giles was like, I found out that there's this weapon we need, but I don't know what it is. Like, yeah, something. they should have planted those seeds of the iconography of the weapon. I think, like, that would have made yeah. it feel le- like the landing a little smoother. Mm-hmm. But to me, they had their big guns of Willow, and I knew that that, I, if the ending with making everybody a slayer to me always felt like it was predetermined from a while ago, yeah. and I do love it yeah. as yeah. a button, but the weapon of it all, 
it's weird, right? Because they don't even need that, right? Yeah. Like, it's like yeah. a trinket, a trifle that we're wasting time on. That, like, if they had just said, like, Willow has the power, we'd be like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And so I don't know why it's in there. I guess as a Frey reader and as, like, a as like a lore person who, like, was absorbing as much Buffy content as the world would allow me at the time, I loved it because it tickled part of my brain. But I do see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. It's t- It's weird because it's, like, we're spending a lot of time on this thing that, and it gets a lot of camera time. Yeah. Like, yeah. We're, they're showing oh, yeah. us how cool this prop they made is at every turn. Every, yeah. Oh, it also, gets the sexy treatment from the cameras for yeah. sure. Like, the lights glistening off of it. Yeah. 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 It, and that's another part of my issue with it is it doesn't look ancient, right? Like, it doesn't. It, mm. Nothing mm. about it looks ancient. It's all like chrome and the like yeah. enamel inlay. Like, it's like, very like, Spencer's hey. gifts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, anyway, okay. Well, we have gotten way ahead of ourselves. So I'm yes, going to yank us back to Kennedy walking dejectedly down an alley, which was yes. a great setup. Like, yes. she has just been, like, put in her place by faith. Even Willow didn't have her back. So, right. you know, on the one hand, you're like, come on. You're really going to walk alone down an alley? But it is it is believable. And then it turns out they were setting up a trap. Yes, I love that because that feels very like the original theme of Buffy, right? Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. a young girl and this girl we know doesn't have the Slayer powers walking alone down a like alley. But then it's like, oop, it was a trap for the bad guys and they capture. Uh, I love it because she doesn't have superpowers because it's like right. a revision of the Buffy story, which is like mm-hmm. maybe your friends are your superpowers or like being smart enough to stay aware is a superpower, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's also a throwback to a scene in the movie, the original movie where Buffy is walking down an alley by herself, like kind of looking a little dejected as a way to lure vampires in. So the fact that mm-hmm. it happened so late in the series and it was a callback to the movie that started it all, I thought was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I love that. Ooh. Um so we get we get the reversal, they get it, we cut to the Summer's house, um, we learn that the Bringer's tongues are cut out. Mm-hmm. Kirsten, what is it that Dawn, Dawn did, like, some research and found a spell, right? <laughs> yes, so she's been reading ancient Turkish texts um, <laughs> to find a spell. <laughs> like, when did Dawn be able to... <laughs> yeah, like, first Sorry. of all, how? Second of all, yeah. you know, as someone who has tried to research Turkish history, guess what? It's not easy if you don't speak Turkish. Um... <laughs> But so Willow's like, oh, I think I've read about that. I read a translation and I love Dawn's just bewildered betrayal. There's a translation yeah. of it. Like, <laughs> such a story. I love Dawn coming into her own. Like I said, you know, I'm the younger sister. Every time I walked into a new class in high school, the teacher would say, oh, are you Erin White's little sister? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> She's <laughs> White's older sister. Um, yeah, so so it was a fun scene. Like I love I love Dawn's betrayal, but yeah, so they have they have their spell and they're talking about that, and then we have Andrew come in and give his debrief. I love that Andrew just is like he opens the door and is nonstop talking. Like he just doesn't stop. He's like, I missed all of you so much. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, blah, blah, blah. We found something, blah, blah, blah. And just like isn't shutting up, isn't reading the room at all. <laughs> And like, kind of, I think he he walks out of the room, doesn't he? Yeah, he has to go. Yeah, he, he has does. to go pee. Right, yes, he right. urinates. <laughs> He's so relatable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Spike asks where Buffy is, um, and I I really like this scene. Mm-hmm. I I really do. Oh, I love too. that because you almost feel like one. Of course, they all know Spike's gonna be pissed, but you almost feel like you can feel that Dawn and Willow, at the very least, are like fuck, mm-hmm. like. You know, the way Dawn's like, oh, she's not here right now. Like, Dawn can't even say, oh, we voted her out of the house. Don't you think that's fair? Like, no, no. one is like... <laughs> right. they, know, they know they did the wrong thing. And Willow's delivery here is so good. Yes. Um, she's so good at pretending to be a bad liar, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, she is. And I love Spike saying, like, oh, you were working on that speech for a while, weren't you? And her just being mm-hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is Spike's I don't know. Slow. I wanted a little more, like, this is what democracy looks like from the crew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree with what they did, but come on, justify it. <laughs> They're like, you did it. <laughs> like, you really are getting the sense, like, they know they screwed up and they can't oh, yeah. justify yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I like that. I just like mm-hmm. that. And like, you know, this is, I, so, I think I've said this a bajillion times. Every single time I watch season seven, I like, feel differently about it. This, thankfully, for this watch, for the podcast, I have felt more like, I see both sides and I feel like everyone's not listening. Like, I feel like everyone just needed to like talk it out a little bit longer. Um, yeah. But 
a spike and face fight here. I can remember like I clapped when I watched this live because I was so I was so angry at Faith, even though it really isn't Faith's fault. Everyone mm -hmm. else votes her out. Faith is like, just chill. We'll talk about it tomorrow. And everyone else is like, no, we're voting Buffy out. The way Faith is like, you know, I think you take it down a notch and Spike like punches her and is like, oh, you finally got what you wanted, which I'm sure is a like hot button for Faith, right? Mm -hmm. And like yep. they go at it. I, I still watch it and I'm like, yeah, Spike's right though. Cause like when he's like, she's died for you people. Are you kidding me? Like, I, I feel like my, I get very, I can get a little frustrated with the Spike Buffy shippers. Um, but this is when I become like my Spike is, this is when, this is the Spike I love, right? Because he is like, what is wrong with all of you? Like, she's your best friend. She's died. She always protects you. And now you kick her out of her own home. Like, it's a fight that, like, I'm glad someone's, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And clearly that's, I, you're right, Kirsten. They had the they had that scene because they needed to have these moments. Yeah. Um, And, like, we needed this moment. And for me, this is, like, season seven is a little rocky for me with Spike and Buffy, but this is, like, a very good version of their relationship where he's, like, part of the group very willing to help but is like what the fuck are you guys talking about you kicked her out of her house mm -hmm. like he's like but the don't only... you think don't you think that's about like a maturity i mean like when he dressed down giles i was like oh yeah he's hundreds of years older mm -hmm. than you so like yeah. sit down kitty like <laughs> right. it did it felt to me like he was like oh my god i am dealing with a bunch of fucking children and <laughs> she's a child and she's not even acting like this like that, <laughs> exactly that was my thoughts exactly was like, like you so rarely feel spike's age but you feel mm -hmm. it in that moment when he's like oh my god these people have been around for some of them like two decades and I'm on my 16th decade or whatever. And like when I was watching it last night, I was thinking like the punch when, cause Spike really does just like well on faith kind of yeah. out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. I thought that seemed unearned, but Kirsten, you make a good point that even as far back as his scene with Andrew, when they're in the monastery, all he's doing is thinking about Buffy and getting back to her. And then like he gets to the kitchen, there's all this bullshit with their, with them like having kicked her out. And then of course, like, what is a physical manifestation of opposition to Buffy more than faith? Mm -hmm. So it makes yeah. sense that, and then when she's like giving him lip, then it makes sense that, and also I just want to say, nobody fights sexier than Eliza Dishku. Like that fight oh is sexier God. than any sex scene that happens later in the episode. Like yeah. I was thinking so during hot. that scene, that <laughs> what I, not, not just that she's hot, but I also yeah. thought what a great touch that this show has that a lot of shows and movies do not have, including sometimes Marvel, not always. <laughs> I think her fighting style is so specific to her yes. personality. And mm -hmm. in such contrast to Buffy and Spike and Angel that I could, I could watch a wire for, CGI model do the move and I could tell you which one of them it, it's yeah. supposed to be and totally. I love that yeah, yeah absolutely yeah yeah I think another reason why this scene works so well and why for me too this is where I'm like I freaking love Spike yeah is because he's speaking for us right he's yeah. saying yeah. Mm -hmm. how we feel about Buffy as the viewer at least for me mm -hmm. in this episode in yeah. this scene and then later when he's talking to Buffy like he is basically like he's us right yeah he's us saying we've watched you do all of these things we know you we know who you are we know why you've chosen these things and you're incredible right and so it, it works so so well for me because like yeah spike has earned this maturity and he's earned this progression but also he's very much an audience stand-in at that point like he's saying mm -hmm. the things we wish we could say to buffy yeah yeah, you're right. I like it because he's a, yeah, he's an outsider. Mm -hmm. Like I love I love him in that role. So yeah, you're 100 percent right. I think it, it it makes for such a special. Um, it make it, it makes the cut through so much better because especially when they the line of like, okay, we've done enough speeches or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's like oh wait no 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 let's make time for this one. Yeah, <laughs> <'Cause> it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like I yeah I I just. I think the show does the show. The thing the show always has done well is like, that's why like Spike and Anya are always good at like reading them mm -hmm. like for filth. And like Cordelia was very good at it Cordelia, too, because yeah. they're the ones that are like, yeah, like I'm part of the mix, but I'm not, you know, I'm not one of the best friends. I'm not the father yeah. figure. I'm not Giles. If I'm not. A, if there's a fight going on in, in, in one of our common areas and five of us are included, but I'm not there. Nobody picks up the phone. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, 
I also love that he walks away. Like he yeah. puts his punches in. She says, we don't know where she is. And then he's like, okay, well, that's all I needed. Like, I don't need yeah. anything from anyone here. You are not worth my time. I'm going to go find Buffy. Although I will say the whole, like, I can smell you. Creepy. Oh, it's yeah. so weird. Yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> they also but... only use that, like, sometimes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's, you know, in the pre cell right. phone days, you had to have a, a magical way of finding someone. But, yeah. Right. Yeah. Weird. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll still never forgive them for, for setting up in the mythos that vampires have no breath, but they smoke cigarettes that drives me right. bananas but anyway <laughs> or that they get out of breath from running i'm like, like they pant. What? yeah 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 exactly Why? yeah <laughs> but yeah they pant like dogs I think. right so yeah. <laughs> so we get yeah we get the uh basement scene mm-hmm. where willow does the spell to try to get the uh bringer to talk and i do love that like when it first starts talking through andrew like xander and kennedy are like oh shut up and then giles is like wait a minute that's yep. the bringer <laughs> <laughs> That moment when all four of them like stand up kind of startled and turn around and look at Andrew is such a good shot. It is such good filmmaking. I love that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So we learn, this is where season seven falters a little bit for, we get a lot of things where we learn information that like, I, I, I'm not quite sure how what he says really leads them to like an armory other than he says they're underground. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little, it was a stretch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, did I miss a line earlier? Because no. It it, it felt very much like they were like, okay, we need to wrap up this episode because you know we need to. Everything in this town is in one of four places. Let's just go walk around. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. I did like when Uh, we tend to the needs of the infinite evil because I was like, oh, motherhood. <laughs> so he says something about like we will we will laugh as they die. Giles cuts his throat, and I do like that Andrew's like, "You are so lucky you didn't magically decapitate me," because like I could see that being a worry, right? <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> but Giles probably was not worried about that. So we cut to Buffy. She's laying in bed. She's depressed. She can hear knocking at the door. Spike walks in. Um, he does. He does the thing that like you want. Not even just a romantic interest, but like someone you, you want someone to do for you, right? Where he's like, he's like, that bitch, she finally, you know, took over for you, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, basically just like blindly being like, hey, I understand you're depressed. Let me try to like do the thing for you, right? Like kind of like when Willow, when Riley and his wife come and Willow and her are clearly getting along, right? And then as soon as they leave, Willow goes to Buffy. What a bitch. Like, you know, it's like <laughs> the very nice best friend thing to do of like, yeah. you are feeling down. So I'm going to make sure that like, you do, you know that like, I'm, I've got you, right? I'm on team you. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and like, you know, Buffy is even still being fair, right? Because uh-huh. Spike doesn't quite know what happened and he's blaming Faith, which if I were Spike, I would also think it was all her. And Buffy even admits it wasn't just Faith. She's like, it was all of them. Like it wasn't, Faith didn't Mm. kick me out on her own. And Spike, like, to try to cheer her up, insists... because we So we talked about this in Dirty Girls. Um, uh, Zach co-hosted, and we had Summer Bishel and Monica Usubreen. And we all were, like, really annoyed that Buffy was wrong in that episode. And I get that she's technically not wrong afterwards. But in the context of that episode, she was wrong. Because they went to go... He said he had something of hers. They went to go find it. There was nothing. People died. They left. But I do appreciate that then, you know, two episodes later, we do make her right, right? Because she's our hero, and I don't like the idea of her, like, getting people killed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, no big deal, nothing, we were wrong. Like, I like at least that Spike is there to remind her that she was right. But even he says that, and she replies, like, she doesn't feel right, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And, like, her... Her like depression, like I I <laughs> had a rough week, and I found myself like when I'm that depressed, I often just like lay in bed and stare at my ceiling, mm-hmm. like and oh, yeah. that's what Buffy's doing, you know. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's I don't know, that's really realistic. Yeah, yeah, that's what makes Buffy always relatable. Is like she has a, I mean, in, in you know, in addition to her phenomenal external strength, she has quite an inner strength, but she's still a human being. Mm-hmm. And when she gets like dealt really heavy blows, a lot of times she does kind of sink into bed and stare at the ceiling. Cause we all do. That's, that's a normal right. human reaction. Yeah. yeah. 
But it's not something that's been afforded her. I mean, I, I, the, these seasons go into it a little bit, but not enough in my taste, just for my taste, because even though they're 22 episode seasons each, I don't <laughs> think there was enough time. Um, but I do think that there's a thing about like, she's had to be some, like, she's had to be there for her mom. She had to be there to save the world, right? <laughs> then she had to die. <laughs> then she came back. Then she saved the world. Then she saved the world. Then her, she saved the world. Then her <laughs> mom died and she had to be an adult. And then she had to die again to save the world. And then her friends raised her sister in her absence. Then she came back, had to get a part-time job while she saved the world from her friend that was supposed to be helping her take care of her sister. Like mm-hmm. It's been relentless. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I do think like, We never really dived into the she went catatonic before she died and then she died and then went to hell and then came back. And we need like, we need like Lorraine Bracco to sit down with her a little bit and talk her through whatever's going on. Um, Because, you know, like we don't, she has had to be so resilient and you get the sense that some of that is like her and like what you have to do under pressure and stuff. But I do wish we saw some of her darkness. Um, I know that season six is very dark. I understand. But I wish we saw some of her darkness um, come out in less productive ways than yeah. the um, the little ways that we saw because like we saw Willow's darkness come out right. in a really unproductive way and, um, Fitz, and I don't know that we ever got that but I guess that that's implying what she's supposed to be doing while she's fucking the immortal is just like you know getting right. her jollies out after a lifetime of hell and like she deserves it it's something that the, the comics um, especially like the continuation uh, of the comics the you know yeah. continuation of the series that sort of delves into is like you know, it's funny because you're saying like she should be talking to Lorraine Bracco or a therapist, and, and my head immediately went to like, oh yeah, the Watchers should like have something where the Slayers can just like talk to somebody and blah blah blah. But then it's like, well, that the Slayers were never designed for long term yeah. mm-hmm. use. They were designed yeah. to save the world a few times and then die, and then a new one is called. Like they're really considered an expendable tool. And the fact that Buffy has lived so long and has been doing this for so long is it's unique. It is Uh completely unusual. So there's like no mechanisms to deal with a slayer's mental health for the long haul because they never live that long. So it's, yeah, I guess they just fuck a couple of vampires. And (laughs) I mean, that's what I would do. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) Especially her vampires. Jesus Christ. Right. You've seen them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, So we cut to the summer's home and we get faith and Giles discussing. And I, I mean, I don't know about the Iraq war metaphors, but it is a little heavy here when she's like, we go to war. And I'm like, but we just had this problem with Buffy. What are you talking about? We go to war. Like that's where I, but I, it's just me being defensive of Buffy. Cause I'm like, you dickheads, you just kicked her out for doing the same thing. And now you're you're, like, what? Um, So I get like, that's where I get like all like, "Mm." but I do like this scene where then she, you know, she closes the door and the mayor is there. The first as I the mayor. I love that moment. I, I will I say first it. though, that little moment of Giles saying, you're doing just fine. Like yeah. on the one hand, you're all stupid and you should not <laughs> get Buffy out. But like, it also made me really sad because Faith needs positive reinforcement yeah. from, from traditional authority figures. <laughs> And that he goes so well into the mayor and to the relationship that she had with the mayor. And um, it was such like a smart tie in where you have the watcher that she never had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He should have had yeah. that she deserved and she didn't have saying you're doing just fine. And then the first appears to her as the father right. authority figure that she did have. Right. And I freaking love the mayor. He's my favorite yeah. villain. Like he's oh, so yeah. great. Harry Green yeah, is I, such a great actor. He's, he's so good. So good. And the thing I love, and I mean, Kirsten, I think we've talked about this a thousand times on the podcast, is that like he genuinely cared about like he yes, he wanted to like turn into this demon, but he genuinely thought of her as like his own daughter, right? He loved me. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes it worse. Yes. Yes. Well that and and it made it like it it increased that sense because it always seemed like Faith was the mirror image of Buffy. And then it like Mm -hmm. extended to their father figures. It Mm -hmm. was really brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know. I know some people talk about characters feeling rocky. You know, I remember um, Jillian Anderson talking about how it was hard for her to come back to Scully that many years later. Uh, Harry Graining like definitely yeah. like dips uh, perfectly right back into this role, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh my god, it's like he uh, oh he's born for it. It's so yeah. good. Although I will say, I, as much as I I am truly, I love that the first brings back all the big bads. The first episode it's stuff so was amazing. It's yeah. So good. However. 
that we could not call up Paul Rubens. Now, <laughs> I'm not telling the man when and where to work. I'm saying <laughs> that this episode would have been a perfect instance for even if we couldn't get the first to fully like be be Paul Rubens to play the first. How great would it have been if we got Paul Rubens to be um uh, the guy whose house he has a gun and like. <laughs> Anyway, um, it was great to have him back, and and I think it's a it speaks to just how well casted and acted the show has been mm-hmm. from beginning to end that they can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like bringing this guy who is in season three, and mm-hmm. like he's still got it, and like it's it still makes terrifying. sense. Yeah, it like makes sense. I love, I love that. Like she says something when she uses the word hell, and he's like, "Language, you're a leader now." Like, yeah. like that's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like so him. And like when he's like, I do like that he also kind of explains the first when he's like, mm-hmm. no, it's, you know, but also it, I am me. Like, and he's like, ask me where I hid my moon pies in my office and ask me who my favorite little woman character is because it's Meg because and like even. Of course mm-hmm. it's Meg. <laughs> 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 and like, I love that shit. And like, yeah. it, it th- this is one of the more effective scenes with the first. And I, I, I'm pretty sure from what I've heard, it's from budget constraints that they could not bring back more people. But mm-hmm. like, this is one of the more like, it, it works because this was a person she loved. You know, the same way it did work when Robin Wood saw his mother mm-hmm. as like a strong scene. This works for me because like, not only is it trying to throw Faith off, but like it kind of is because this is the only like parental figure she had in her life. And that makes it work because he's not like, ooh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get you. He's just kind of like chatting with her, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And their chemistry, Eliza Dushku and Harry Greener, it's yeah. just, it's so good. And just snaps right back to that season three dynamic, which is yes. incredible. Yes. Yeah. So we then cut back to Buffy and uh, Spike. And again, this is where my, this is where I become a, a Spuffy shipper because Jesus Christ, he's, James Marsters acting in this scene is mm-hmm. No notes. Ten out of ten. Yep. So good. So and the tender. lines, the lines they give him when he's like, "Oh, it's bloody chaos over there," and he's like, "Well, it was messy." Um, <laughs> and when like, <laughs> and when and her reaction to when he's like, "Oh, you know, I went in. I wasn't really there that long. Punched faith and left." And her reaction to that, I love. Yeah. And Kirsten, I was thinking of you because you are very mature. I am not. Um, you are like. And I feel like it reminded me of you because when you try like to be like, ooh, maybe I'll be petty for a second, but then we'll get back back on track. And like, <laughs> that's like very much what her reaction felt to me. And I love that shit because that also is very Buffy, right? Yeah. yeah. It did allow her this moment of like petty, like, oh, they are suffering without me. And then like the way her eyes light up when he says hit faith a bunch of times. Yeah. It's great. It's great on both <laughs> their parts. Like they're both just, it's a great scene. And then it, it instantly snaps back to... Um, you know, Buffy taking it seriously. Like those were yeah. girls that I got killed. Like, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And like, ugh, his line of like a hundred, a hundred plus years. And there's only one thing I've ever been sure of oh. you. Ugh. Oh, <laughs> it's such a good line. It's so uh, romantic. I also <laughs> really loved when he's like, no, no, it's my turn to talk. Cause she's talking about yes. distance. Right. Which is, you know, mm-hmm. very self-aware of her because she does do that with, you know, with yes. good reason, but, but she's coming to that realization. Um, and then <laughs> Spike's like, no, it's my turn to talk. He starts talking and she said, what are you trying to say? And he says, I don't know. I'll know when I'm done saying it. I was like, oh, that's like my drafting process. Um, <laughs> but it's really, and it's cute because it, it somehow manages to make it feel, make what he's saying feel very organic, right? Yes. Because he is mm-hmm. essentially giving a speech. He's again, standing mm-hmm. in for the audience, giving a, this is why we love you, Buffy speech. Mm-hmm. But, but the way he delivers it and the way it's written does make it seem very much like this is just, it's spur of the moment. He's saying it as he's thinking of it. And it's yeah. it's great. I like a plus delivery on everything. You know what? Kirsten, you're right. It's that because he does, he does do some pauses that yeah. make it feel yeah. like he's Spike like, is he's thinking. Like, Where was I? What yeah. was I saying? Oh, right. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, well, I mean, and this is all credit to Sarah Michelle Gellar because she sells the shit out of anything you've ever mm-hmm. put in front of her. <laughs> yeah, uh, God. Um, but that's why the speechifying got a little bit, 
old over the course of the season was because they were so well written mm-hmm. and there was so much dense stuff packed into them that it's yeah. that and there's so much stuff that clearly the writers wanted to say that it's like when did Buffy have time to draft a speech? <laughs> like, what, what are we talking about? It, it doesn't feel extemporaneous. Yes. Um, but they're good, so you let it go a couple times. But the reason Spike's both of Spike's little speeches worked was because it's like. It, I don't know. James Marsters just sells this like flying by the seat of my yeah. pants, not like yeah. chaos that, yes. you know, you need a little of it felt great. It was really good. Yeah. I mean, this, this whole episode is James Marsters and Eliza Dushku giving you a little like acting clinic mm-hmm. while Sarah <laughs> Michelle takes like, you know, she, she's going to do her tough scene, but she's also going to take a day to nap. Yeah. Because she's got a lot to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's, true. it's true. And then we have Buffy saying, I don't want to be the one. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's so heartbreaking and it's so true. Like, yeah, like we've talked about, she was saddled with this like insane burden that she didn't ask for and she can't get rid of and she has to do it and she's tired. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this, this moment where she asks him to stay and to just hold her, like, it is such a tender moment. It's such a yeah. good moment. And like the thing that I love about this scene is it's earned, right? Like we know yeah. their history. Mm-hmm. We know what they've been through. We know how they know each other. We know what they've done to each other. And mm. that they can still have this moment of just like this intimacy. Yes. Um, it feels earned and I love it. And I've always loved that scene. Like I wrote my notes, like I try to capture that feeling sometimes in my writing just because like that feeling of that specific scene right there. Mm-hmm. Where everybody's yeah. broken down. Everything feels bleak. You know, there's so much history, so much pain and so much love between them. And then just that, just that stay with me, just, just hold me. This is, this is what I need you to be for me right now. And you're the only person who can, who can do that for me. And it's like, yeah, it's so great. It's so great. Yeah. I, I will fully admit no one's probably surprised, but like I sobbed when I first watched this and okay, I didn't sob, but I definitely still cried watching this scene today. Like earlier today, I was like, oh fuck, this still hits me. God. (laughs) It's nice because the theme of the episode seems to be, or like one of the themes of the episode seems to be um, something that I don't think the show touches on a ton, which is like intimacy and tenderness and like, and physical touch even. I mean, the title of the episode, there's, there's not, there's not always a great time for it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't always feel natural to slip into, mm-hmm. but it is it's as important as all the rough, tough, you know, rowdy, rough boy stuff. You right. know, yeah. like yeah. It, it's it's important. The punching and the kicking and the throwing is it, it's as important that you have a something that you have comfort. You have a reason to be doing it. You have mm-hmm. like a place, a shelter to think and feel, and um, that's what separates our heroes from the. Uh, Caleb's and firsts of the world because they're not taking a moment right. to do that. They're yeah. just like right. hacking away at their giant axe in a rock or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the thing that I loved about it too, because obviously, like, it's placed in uh, what I lovingly refer to as the fucking montage. Mm-hmm. Is this, <laughs> that, like, is is that so much of the show going back to the second season was really about Buffy's sexual mm-hmm. growth? I mean, it's about you know her, her transition from being a girl into a young woman. And so, obviously, sexuality is a big part of that. And the show has really dealt with Buffy's sexual progression or what have you. And I love that by the time we get to this moment, almost at the end, it's it's almost like she has had that journey and she doesn't mm-hmm. need that journey anymore. Now what she needs is really that emotional vulnerability and intimacy while yeah. everyone else is, you know, humping around. And right. I just Buffy I said, was, I'm pro Iraq war and pro celibacy. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm joking. It was so positive, but she just didn't need it in that moment. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we cut to Faith and the mayor. He's, you know, he says, no one will ever love you the way I loved you. And mm-hmm. which like 100% That's- is like pushing her button, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's also like grooming, gaslighty, like yep. abusive behavior. You know, like trying to say like you'll never. Yeah, like have maybe it's like for me. the best that nobody yeah. ever loves me like yeah. you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but, but you like, know what I mean. That's what abusers say, like abusers say, like who who are you going to go to? No one will love you like I love you. You know, so it's like I think they they chose those words very particularly. Yeah, well, yeah. I I do think also in the context of the show. No one has loved her the way that right. Like, yeah, we, that's like true. if, yeah, if that's we're just true. considering, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like, you know what I mean? Like, in the context of Buffy, like, no one is real. Like, her and Buffy were super close, but then that fell to shit pretty quickly. And like, the mayor was the only one that like consistently, even if she messed up, he would like you know have like a jaunty little like speech to give her and be like, well, next time we'll get the Slayer. I love you. Go home and you know play some video games and right, like. Right, right. 
But so Faith I, hooking up with 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 Principal Robin Wood was such a good moment for me because it he could so easily be a father and authority figure for her to bounce off of the way that she has several others like Giles and the mayor yeah. and even mm-hmm. Wesley to a degree. Um, and instead of doing that, she very she makes a slightly more mature choice, which fucking isn't always, but certainly is a slightly more mature choice to be like, I don't need that kind of love. I right. can get other things in my life and I I can give that to myself and like I'm I'm walking away from that. And it was a nice and and she didn't want him to see it, right? Like I loved when he came in and she was like, What did you see? Yeah. Because she's like, I don't want you to know that part of me. That's the past. Like we're right. moving mm-hmm. forward. I love that. Oh, Faith is such a good character. <laughs> yeah. Single greatest joke, maybe ever, is the yeah, the first is really good at finding your Achilles heel. And she's like, oh, you just talk to me. <laughs> what, it does a heel thing too? I know. Like, I cackle. I cackle. <laughs> and like, and it's so, it is so funny, but it also says so much about Faith because yeah, she doesn't, you know, she didn't finish school. She's not yeah. educated and she feels inferior for those things a lot of the time. But I love that they have this moment where where Robin Wood is like, well, I'm the principal of a school where no one graduated. So yeah. Also, yeah. like, let's just, I mean, Robin Wood is so dreamy. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I mean, to have that dreamy guy say to her too, like, she was like, I was absent that day. And he just smiles because it's like, yeah, he deals with yeah. he understands. Yeah. He gets it. He's seen it. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I loved it. Oh, she's so good. He's so good. What a great episode. <laughs> so what a television show. Someone should really <laughs> comment on what a good television show we're watching. Someone should start a podcast about it. <laughs> yeah. um, so at this point in the episode, my eight-year-old came in. Oh no. And, oh, no. oh boy. Uh, so yeah, we, we paused very quickly. Um and so this is how weird my eight-year-old's life is. He sees me taking notes, watching the TV show, and he's like, oh. Are you writing a book about this movie? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yes, so so once we got rid of my eight year old, (laughs) we have the sex montage. Um, So yeah, we've got we've got the various couples, um, you know, doing various things. Let's cut to Kennedy's hair twirl, and like you know, a hundred percent, she told the other potential is why they couldn't be in there like she yeah that out yeah <laughs> listen i gotta so, get laid just please uh, give me I have, uh, yeah i have my issues i'm so conflicted with this scene because on the one hand it was vastly the most sexual gay touching i had ever yes. seen on network tv up to that point mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. point where i remember i was watching concurrently to this season i was watching queer as folk the american version and mm-hmm. I was like, damn, this is like, I mean, we're not seeing boobs or anything, but this is almost on par with how how sexual and physical the touching is on that show. Um, and so for that, I applaud it. And even, even though I'm not a huge fan of Kennedy, I still love it. And like, you know, to your point, Ian, the fact that it was like, this wasn't about love. This was really about sex and getting that yeah. kind of, you know, aggression out there. My problem, I fucking hate that granny lingerie that kennedy is wearing that looks like <laughs> an 80 year old woman would be wearing i was like we need to so airlift rihanna ugly. into this <laughs> what the fuck like no first of all she's supposed to be a 21 year old girl who would not be what the fuck was did that did she pull that out of joyce's wardrobe <laughs> That's I, was I was like well they're still in the buffy house maybe she just found joyce's mom's yeah. old thing that she wore to bed <laughs> <laughs> oh, so ugly Maybe. and the least sexy thing. And and uh, I can't remember her name. It's Ayari something who played Ayari Lamon, yeah. yeah. Who's a gorgeous woman. Yeah. She's stunning. So She's stunning. And like, you know, I, she perfect body. They could have put anything on her. Well, no, not anything on her and made it look good. Clearly <laughs> not. But, yeah, but they, they could have gone in a lot of different directions and that just bothered me. It still bothers me. But I you saw know it again what? I like the it. theme of lesbians on this show not knowing how to dress themselves. So <laughs> alternatively, <laughs> looking phenomenal one or the other no okay. middle ground it Fair really enough. is Fair enough. so so i do love the beat of we cut to anya and xander eating ice cream in the kitchen <laughs> and yeah. anya says i mean if we're done having sex then everyone else should just knock it off because that is also me that is how i feel <laughs> that relatable <laughs> content a hundred percent yeah if i am not getting laid no one else is allowed to get laid <laughs> yeah, totally. oh boy i've had that fight <laughs> yeah <Same. laughs> Um, and and then we we do get the montage, and then we do eventually cut back to Xander and Anya, and they are having sex on the kitchen floor. Um, yeah. And I can remember because, and Kirsten, we've discussed this. I still, no matter, I, I understand Xander's issues, but I just don't think he would have left her at the altar. And I think they should have been allowed to be a couple 
and yep. like be a married couple on the show. Yep. Um, do I think Anya is better than Xander? Yes, of course I do, but she <laughs> loves him. Mm-hmm. So but like, I think if they, I, I have started to come around to the fact that if they had had more time and mm-hmm. if they felt like they had had more runway, they could have had them get married and then have him slowly like it comes right. apart because yeah. of his issues, but they just didn't. And it felt like they were like, well, let's just pack in as much development <laughs> as we can. <laughs> I also feel like it's lazy writing to say that happy couples, couples with yes. a functioning relationship can't be interesting. Like, yes. I agree. Yeah, I agree 100% with that. The, yeah. the other thing is like, as I've gotten older too, is just like the 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 idea of, of a, of a you know, 1100 year old person dating a 20 year old guy and then <sighs> getting mad when he's, when he behaves in an immature fashion is kind of like, well, what, like he's a child, I'm, you know, I'm 40 and I think a 20 year old is a child. <laughs> so it's See, like, I said I, all this spike stuff earlier, but in my mind, yeah. what is canon is that they become like suspended maturity animation or something. I, that's the, like, I that's can't, the only I way can't I can wrap, yeah, that's the only mm-hmm. way I can wrap my head around it is that it's, they cannot mature past the point when they were turned immortal. Cause other than that, it just drives me crazy. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fair. Um, yeah. So then we, we cut back to Caleb, in the first and I, it seems like the first is watching them have sex but and yeah like <laughs> in the space like yeah right? I don't know I don't, oh, know. I don't know I mean see, first has said the, in the minds and hearts of everyone everyone maybe the first is watching us fuck <laughs> I, <laughs> sure, I, like I, think, yeah. I think the first is definitely watching them all fuck absolutely <laughs> so yeah. Caleb says they, the first says like I envy them and Caleb's like they're just sinners you are sin and we get a lot of like that Love that yeah. Um, just a great line. Although I cannot get over his like baggy low jeans with a belt with the oh my God. priest top. Like it, it's, <laughs> he's a Costco priest. Yeah, I mean, like that's <laughs> that where you know of, he's really evil. You're like, just put together a better outfit, bud. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that like baggy jeans look with the belt. I do remember guys wearing that a lot at, in that like, era. Priest like, tops. Well, no, that, yeah. That's a little. I mean, I would wear a priest top, but everybody else. No. Yeah. Yeah. But that's for a very specific night at a very specific club. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so we get and we get like the first says like I know why they grab at each other to feel. I want to feel. I want to wrap my hands around someone's some innocent neck and watch it crack. Caleb says, "Amen." We find Buffy waking up. Then we cut to the Summers house, and Andrew is giving everyone. A debriefing on what they found, which still kind of feels like nothing. <laughs> but it does give us a line. It's a pleasure, Faith. Back to yes. you. Yes, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> He's so happy to be included. I know. I know. Oh, sweet I, God, I love Andrew. Oh, yeah. no. So Faith says, like they're sending some folks to check on Buffy, and then the ones who are coming with her to the armory know who they are. I still feel very like, what? We're going to a, like Arsenal Armory place? Like, why? Um, but sure, fine. We cut back to the to Caleb in the first. They see a bringer falling down the steps, and we're back at the vineyard. Um, and this this version of Buffy is the version like I love when, and you know, this has happened many a time, right? She gets beaten down, and then she comes back way more confident and way more cocky, and I mm-hmm. fucking love that. Oh, and like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why she's my hero, right? Because she can have these, like, low lows and, like, embrace them. And, like, yeah, she's going to lay in bed staring at the wall. But the next day, she's like, I'm going to kick his ass. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm going to go there and I'm going to fight him and I'm going to get whatever the fuck he has that's mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, I love Well, we wallowed. Time to fucking do what I was going to do anyway. (laughs) I love it because it's true. It's it's how we go to work. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah, it makes sense. She's, you know, she gets, like, she gets knocked around. She gets punched and it hurts. But then she figures out how he punches and how he moves. And then it's like, okay, Mm -hmm. all right. It sucked the first time, but now I'm, I'm going in with a lot more knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, you know, he goes to punch her. She does, like, a Matrix-style, like, a voidy thing. I love it. Uh, the, fir- the first is even taunting Caleb, saying he's embarrassing. So then we get the the faith and the potentials going into this, like, armory place. Mm-hmm. And we, like, are cutting back and forth. And I actually do like that. Yeah. Um. You know, they're ambushed by the bringers. They have a fight that's definitely a little too dark for me. I couldn't. I, but I'm sure that's probably so on I purpose. I have a specific note on that. And like, I thought the flashlight fight was clever and convenient for obscuring choreography. And also, yeah. again, never letting you see any of the potentials that don't matter. Yes. So it gives yes. the impression yeah. that a lot of people are doing a lot of things, but they don't have yeah. to have extensive, complicated choreography. And they also yeah. don't have to show you exactly how many people are there. It's, yeah. That is very true. And it's funny. I, I have a, a background in fight choreography. And... Um, 
when I watched the show originally, that was before I did any training. And I thought that was so cool. The idea of having, you know, flashlights and it's just, Ooh, it looks different. It looks dynamic, but like choreographing a fight with that many people Mm -hmm. would take a very long time. And this episode kind of felt a little rushed, I think. Mm -hmm. So that seems to me like, Oh, they probably were like, okay, we have this huge battle and you know, the season finale, which is two episodes from now, which I'm sure they're going to take, you know, probably weeks to choreograph because there's so many people in it and we need to throw in a, a fight scene here. So, you know, to your point, Kirsten, how do we just make it look like there's a big fight scene happening without actually having to choreograph anything too crazy? And Wait, it, you know. there wasn't a big fight scene? <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Yeah. It, it does. It yeah. really does, though. You're right. Mm-hmm. So then we get Caleb is like annoyed and he calls Buffy a whore and Buffy has such a good line. I love that, like, he calls her a whore as she's kind of like in the midst of like doing like a walk or like a walk away fight move or whatever. And she just turns around and she, I wrote it down. She says, you know, you really should watch, watch your language. Someone, if someone didn't know you, they might think you're a woman hating jerk. And I just <laughs> love that shit. Cause like Caleb feels very on the nose for me. Uh-huh. So I'm glad that she's just like saying like, you're being really obvious with this shit. Like there's no subtext here. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's what we call lampshading in the biz. <laughs> when you <laughs> refer to something in a script, that's obviously happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was um, well done. It was well done. And perfectly yeah, so, delivered because Sarah Michelle Geller perfectly delivers every when fucking line that ever. Yeah. Really a goddess. Yeah. He knocks over a barrel. She sees something shiny from underneath a trap door. Then we cut to the potentials. And like I really like the back and forth here. Like yeah. I love the like and also because I'm petty and because I love Buffy and she is my hero, it feels very good to watch Buffy be right and yeah. everyone else, as Adam Sass said in the last episode, catch a bomb right in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, oh my god, that's so rough! But it's great, I mean, Adam. It's true, great, but great. yikes, yes. that is a yeah. way to put it. Okay, but, but it is it's a great juxtaposition, right? Because yes. they, they separated. Buffy went after the thing that she knew they needed to go after. And the others went after the thing that they decided they should go after. And that there's just the just juxtaposition, the parallel storytelling of like, they're doing the same things. Oh, look, here's the thing. Buffy yeah. finds her, her shiny, you know, death metal ax. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they find a box with a bomb. Like it's such a great ending. It's such yeah. a great ending. It is. Although I will say I groaned at one point and it was, uh, it was during her fight with Caleb when Caleb, frustrated, just pushes over the barrel right, that's yeah. hiding the, <laughs> the entrance thing. to the yeah. side that he knows about. Like yeah. that barrel should have been destroyed in their fight. Mm-hmm. The <laughs> fact that like it was it was such like a plot convenient moment and it was so stupid of Caleb to do that that yeah. I don't believe he would be that stupid, yeah. even if he was frustrated. Well, and then she dives through and another yeah. barrel falls on top. Like that's somehow right. going to prevent it because we've established like he is strong enough to move those barrels. So right. oh, yeah. that's yeah. really yeah. going to give her enough time to like walk around and discover the thing. I, you know, yeah, I yeah. agree. It was very Donkey Kong Country 3. I like how she just <laughs> slipped right in there. She said, King K. Cruel, you're not coming in here. <laughs> you know, I do feel like there's a there's a sad dearth of barrels being used in fight scenes. These days. <laughs> yeah. This is going to tie into my whole anvil and, and um, pianos falling from the sky thing. Go. And we can't get into it right now. <laughs> so I, and I even like the music that swells when Buffy sees the scythe. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I mean, that scythe looks hot. It, it, they they lit that thing within an inch of its life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, Kirsten, you are right. It does not look ancient, but I think it looks like, and I say this, and I don't even know how why I'm using this word to describe a web, but it looks sexy. It's very it sexy. No, it's oh, a yeah. great looking weapon. Like, if somebody yeah. had forged that specifically for her at that time, yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's like the yassification of a weapon. You know, like it looks, it looks so slick and stylish and just fabulous. The that crystal like, Versace. It, it is, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I want to, I want to, I want to see it sashay down the runway. I really, do. it looks amazing. <laughs> and you know, I, I do also love that we, the bomb doesn't go off. Like no. the literally, like it ends with Faith saying, "Like everyone, get down!" And like it still is like beeping over mm-hmm. the credits. I think that's yeah. like a very good and almost like something Buffy hadn't really done before, mm-hmm. right? Like that's like. It, 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 literally a bomb is going off like there's no like yeah. it's like you know you would use it as a magic. metaphor but that's right, literally right, right. what's happening yeah yeah not yeah. since the missile launcher yeah. <laughs> oh, but that wasn't even yeah. like the episode didn't end on it you know yeah right, right, right. Um, very yeah. 24 i was thinking it was very 24 yeah yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And now with a fashion roundup for Touched, we have season seven costume designer, Matt Van Dyne. Hello, Matt. Hey, 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 everybody. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. I'm excited to see what you got for us. We're so close to the very end. I know, I know. You know, I have to, you know, go back and look at the numbers because I thought, now, is this show 19, show 20? (laughs) So, yeah, we're on 19. No, we're on 20, aren't we? 20, yeah. And there's only 22. That's yeah. right. So we're close to the end, but close to the end, I do have my scripts. So, you know, I have a lot of notations in my uh, script from, you know, the uh, initial reading. And it's it's funny what I, I encounter when looking at these scripts. And then, you know, of course, I remember the clothing. I'll go back and, yeah. you know, see something, you know, watch it. I've, I've I Actually, I watched Touched. I probably watched it about three times through this time because oh, really? I was, I, well, I, I think because it continues on from another episode and I, I'm trying to keep everything, you know, separate, you know, <laughs> and I'm having trouble separating out, out the episodes, but I believe at the beginning of this episode, they are in continuation from the previous episode, right? Yeah. All these, these last five kind of like continue one right after the oh, other. Okay. Yeah. Well, and then I, you know, I, <laughs> I laughed to myself because I, I think I had said before to all you people out there that this outfit that Sarah's wearing is one of my favorites. Well, I guess I didn't realize when I said that she ends up wearing it in, I think, three episodes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't quite aware of that. So. I was thinking about that because I was like, well, you can tell it's Matt's favorite because she wears it for a while. <laughs> Somebody should have spoken up and said, you know, well, <laughs> you know, she does wear it. But you know what was interesting in my notes were two things, actually that I just went back right before we uh, started, you know, speaking, I was looking at the script and I, I, and when I look at my script, I don't always look at the opposite page, but I do have notes on the opposite page, which is a blank page when, if you're Mm -hmm. reading a script, but I'll have a note over there. And there were two things when we see uh, the character of Buffy uh, enters the house and she, uh, uh, encounters the man with a gun, yeah, and you know he leaves. I did. I do have a memory of dressing uh, that particular person. I remember him, and I remember doing that that outfit for him. But also, what happens? You know, she crawls into bed later, and in mm-hmm. my notation, I thought, well, that's pretty thorough. I asked. I must have asked at the production meeting. Well, what color are the sheets going to be? Because I wanted to make mm. sure that didn't clash. It didn't clash. Yeah. So I thought, yeah. well, that's pretty thorough. <laughs> Matt, I, I want you to know. I guess we've been doing this so long. I feel like it makes sense we'd be on the same page. But I was going to ask you yeah. specifically if you had to like if you planned how the sheets would look when they're Isn't cuddling that together. Funny? There we are. <laughs> and you, you are so. Yeah, we do know each other pretty well, don't we? We we have gotten to know each other really well yeah <laughs> but yeah that is true and i i didn't come up with that until right before we went on the air here so <laughs> and then in another scene sarah continues to wear that outfit and uh toward the end of the episode she's that's when she encounters caleb i guess and then goes down the hole right yeah 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 okay well in my notes i have you know that she is going to be on a wire, and so is her stunt double. And I, mm-hmm. I thought, and then I'm thinking to myself, well, then how do we do that? Because I don't know that I had that many of those coats. Oh, right, because you made that, you built that, right? I you did. That, right? I yeah. think I do have a note in here that says "make coats." It says that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it says so it's like well make more <laughs> we must have made more of them yeah so so but i thought that was interesting about that episode and i i you know i think we discussed that coat before but i mm. i went back and forth about what was made and what wasn't well some of it was made if, if not all of it so uh, is that, is that more of a pain in the ass for you having to, after it's already done, go back and make well, it again? Yeah. I mean, you know, because you want to match uh, yeah. as, as as closely as possible. You want to match things. So, uh, but I do have a note also about her sliding across the floor on her knees. And then I have a note that says jeans on the stunt double. So we must have made the jeans look like her mm. actual pants. We probably, yeah. you know, doctored them in some way, I guess, to make them yeah. look 
as if you know they were the actual pant, which is not a gene in that in that particular um, outfit, you know. But but yeah, interesting because you know going backward, I wouldn't have known <laughs> that this was going to happen in this episode. So, so, you know, you've got to kind of roll with it you know, yeah. <laughs> when they come up with something and go, Oh, okay. Well, um, I have to make this work. Like, Oh, I have to make 500 more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like that. And, you know, speaking of 500, there are so many people in yeah. these episodes, you know, and I have like in my notes, uh, 20 to 30 uh, background people uh, in certain God. scenes. And I'm like, and then we added a potential name, Caridad, I believe yeah. is her name, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I have lots of, you know, purchases for her. And I, you know, when I'm first going through, you know, I think I went to my, um, my records first to see what we had purchased or what, you know, mm-hmm. we designed or whatever. And I'm seeing that name come up and I'm going, oh, that must be somebody new. And then, of course, I have it circled in my notes and I have a, a it's called a teaser. They give you uh, before they give you the full script. It'll give you highlights of things that are coming up in the next episode, you know, and mm-hmm. and that, you know, it's big stamped across across it. Confidential, not for release, <laughs> you know, because they don't want to let anything out ahead of time, you know, of course. Right. But a lot of things come to you, come to the designer, I should say, uh, that way or come to anybody else, you know, involved in. Yeah, you know, producing, you know, what's in this episode, you know, but the, I'll have notes like, you know, somebody has is, you know, there's water involved or, or blood involved or, and that'll give me a heads up, you know, certainly in anything coming up that uh, we will um, purchase, you know, that I, I want to make sure I can get multiples of it and all of that, you know, for as many people or as, as many outfits as we need for the certain people. But in this episode, what I noticed in the notes, uh, because of Caleb, uh, there were uh, he's wearing Calvin Klein jeans. <laughs> as it turns out. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's what they are. And they were um, we bought four pair of those, as it turns out. I, I saw that, and they came from uh, Macy's, and I think they were well for four pair of them. They were three hundred and twelve dollars. So doing the math, uh, what would that be? Like seventy. Oh, geez. $3 a piece or $78 a piece, I guess. Yeah, that's what they'd be. But, um, but yeah, so uh, we, we, I, I, I guess maybe I bought more jeans for him because of whatever stunts were going on. Mm, and, yeah. and it's funny, when I'm watching this episode, I specifically remember uh, Nicholas's um, red and white plaid shirt. I remembered that. And I said to myself, watching it before I went to my records, I think that's a lucky shirt, lucky brand shirt. And sure okay. enough, it was, but we I didn't buy it at Lucky. I bought it at Barney's. And yeah, okay. and it was uh something like in the range of like $120 or something like that. But I do remember that shirt. I have uh, a a specific memory of that. And um I had notes on uh what other outfits did we have here? Uh something for Dawn, a rust. Oh, with the print collar shirt, I guess it is, uh, came from co-op uh, Barney's. It was a co-op brand, Barney's, okay. which I think is an in-house brand at Barney's, or was. Barney's is no longer, unfortunately. I feel like I feel like you've brought up co-op before. I feel like yeah, that brand has come yes, up Yes, I think co-op is one of the um, leather jackets for Spike, that, oh, okay. that I, as I recall. And uh, that came from Barney's, and... That was something like $150. And, uh, oh, that cute, uh, it's like a green sweater she uh, cardigan she's wearing with a little pink scoop. Like It looks like a tank. I'm not sure it is a tank. It's a scoop neck underneath. It has like a design. But uh, that was from Barney's as well. And uh, the little uh, sweater was, cardigan was, uh, co-op $120 and the scoop neck was $200. I don't know what, the, uh, what brand that was. So I didn't mm-hmm. make a note of that. And then, um, uh, I have for Willow a skirt that she was wearing and I love the name of the skirt. I think it's when it's her second outfit, I believe in the episode, okay. I, I believe. And she has a brown top on and I wish I could, uh, tell everybody 
exactly where the jewelry came from for Alice and Willow, because I love her jewelry. I think it's so pretty. I, I, mm. But I, I, it's somewhere deep in the bowels of my <laughs> notes, but I, I haven't been able to unearth it yet. But that skirt, she's wearing a black and cream skirt, and the name of the skirt, uh, the, the, design, or the designer is True Menacing. <laughs> All right. yeah, I thought that was adorable, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that skirt was like it was only like ninety eight dollars, and and then I think Anya is wearing uh, uh, Emma Anya is mm-hmm. wearing a, another skirt. Now I, her skirt was a lot more expensive. It's a print skirt. I, I love that skirt. As I recall, it's a uh, multicolor and it's three hundred and sixty five dollars, and that came from Barney's as well. The skirt was three hundred and sixty five dollars. Three hundred and sixty five dollars. Holy yeah. shit! <laughs> I spent a, I spent a lot of money on some of these people. It was just I think you know I would gauge it like, well, I don't have to spend you know if I had already purchased a lot for Sarah, yeah, that freed up you know a lot of money to spend elsewhere. And, and I guess her wearing the same thing for a few yes, episodes kind of exactly helped. Exactly, yeah. that helped, and I could spend money someplace else. And mm. I was looking at. Uh, db's uh principal woods uh t-shirt and i finally found that that came from Saks, and it was a theory uh blue theory t-shirt and again nobody rocks a t-shirt like db woodside i mean he just <laughs> yeah. he rocks everything he wears he really does and that was a theory t-shirt and it was 135 dollars. and then i i made a, a just a little scribble note to myself about felicia day her her little outfit this and uh, the second change that she wears where it's like the asymmetrical blue uh ruffle that runs across her her little shirt underneath her cardigan and i thought that was so cute but i don't know where that came from i was looking for it but i can't tell you where it came from <laughs> but um but a lot of the new clothes purchased for this episode were, were for the character uh Caridad. and i i saw you know a lot of things for her from nordstrom and a lot of the potentials uh, and their stunts for this episode came from Nordstrom as well. And then I saw uh, a note to myself for Faith, her little black uh, tee that she wears is made by Juicy, and that came from Bloomingdale's. That's where that's from. And I'm trying to see what other notes I might have here for you. But those are basically my main memories of this episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, the purchases and uh, the design elements with, like I said, the wire and all of that, you know, that really did change, you know, when they do stunts like that, you know, you have to basically cut open the back of whatever you have or (laughs) or make it that way and make sure there's a seam up the back, (laughs) which there was on that coat. So, and that was probably by design, I guess. So, You know, so planning <laughs> planning ahead, yeah, planning ahead. That, that worked out well, but uh, but I, you know, I, I and I noticed, you know, a lot of the sleepwear in this episode. But I must have purchased some of that ahead of time. And I did have a note uh, for Eliza uh, for her scene with DB uh, to make it modest. You know, that what she no was problem. wearing, and so. She was probably, you know, she's a young girl and she probably, mm-hmm. you know, wasn't, you know, prepared, you know, to, right. <laughs> to, to, to be that uh, forthcoming in that way. So, so, uh, you know, of course, I, uh, you know, accommodated all of that. And then I believe, uh, don't, aren't there, there are bringers in this episode, right? Yes. I think so. Yeah. Yes. And I did, oh, I did have a note that I bought all the fabric for, for, for the bringers. Those were all made. Everything was made. And those can, that fabric I bought downtown. It was a resource I used uh, several times called Rag Finders. Uh, that's a great name, okay. isn't it? <laughs> For it is, yeah. Rag <laughs> but they, they always had uh, a lot of stock and good prices. So I didn't have to like spend tons of money. And I think, mm-hmm. which uh, is it in this episode? Do we have the Uber vamps do they, or do they show up in the next? No, episode? they show up in, uh, the, later. Not till the finale. The I finale. Think. But I yeah. think there's a, there's something where in the, maybe it's in the next episode where we get a kind of a hint of them, but I'm going to wait and talk about all them at the okay. very end. Yeah. You know, Cause that's a whole, <laughs> whole subject unto itself. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so touched, uh, interesting episode, not as, 
as quite as active as the other episodes, but there was the stunts at the end. So, oh, so that, cool. that uh, those are my memories, and I hope uh, nice. I hope I enlightened a few people <laughs> out there <laughs> on what we were going through for this episode. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, Matt. We will see you uh, next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And okay, so favorite outfit, Tim. Okay. It's a three-way tie. In case it's not obvious from this whole talk that we just had, Faith is absolutely my favorite character. Um, (laughs) And so I am giving it a three-way tie between the three outfits that she wears in this. Now, one is kind of a cop-out because it was what she was wearing in the previous episode, but it is actually, I think it is 100% my favorite, basic black tank top, jeans, black leather wrist cuff, spiked early 2000s belt. She looks looks so good. She looks so This is how Ian dresses every day. (laughs) Yeah. I was going to say, as like a gay boy who was watching the show, I tried to dress like Faith. Like she just looked amazing. And then when she changed- I I thought Coles could recreate the look. Could not. (laughs) And the thing is, I'm so glad early 2000s fashion is coming back because I've been waiting for a while for that to happen. But then like the the tight black shirt and with the long sleeves and the black pants that she that she was wearing looked great. The black and like silver metal looked amazing. And then honestly, the denim jacket with the green cargo pants and the red shirt. This is just two thousands realness, and she looks amazing. Yeah. So that's my favorite. yeah, yeah. The the fact that you can say someone looked good in cargo pants and I'm agreeing mm-hmm. says a uh-huh. lot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, Ryan, favorite outfit. I do appreciate that um, the first in Buffy skin, uh, for budgetary reasons, does dress very much like if Buffy had her shit together and like was like like owned a business. <laughs> and if you had a business that you gave it cared about, um, uh, that that I love those vibes. But I think my ultimate favorite costume of the episode has to be Kennedy's granny panties because it oh. finally humbled her in my eyes, and I, we needed we needed her to be brought back to earth. We we do love a hot person being humbled, right? A hundred percent. <laughs> that's what's keeping me alive right now <laughs> yeah. Kirsten favorite outfit I mean I know she wore it the previous episode too but I'm very into the like dark tank underneath a semi sheer white long sleeve shirt because yeah. it manages to be mm. both demure and kind of sexy at the same time like that's a fine mm. line to walk and Buffy walks it very well I, Buffy looks very good in white yeah. I, she, like, not does. everyone can pull no. off all that white but no. she really does Yeah. the only thing that bothers me is that that white sheer shirt like puckered at the neck it was not flattering mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. the neckline looked a little weird but but other than that i agree i love i love you're right it was like sexy and demure at the same time which is mm-hmm. really cool well kirsten you'll not be surprised again that uh that was my favorite outfit last episode so the only <laughs> that's the only reason i didn't pick it for this episode was well i picked this last episode because it was <laughs> what she wore uh kirsten and i almost always agree on shit <laughs> um so tim i'm actually going with you because faith like it's so, and Ryan, you're right. I feel like I got all my fashion tips from like Oz and Faith in 1999. <laughs> yes, you did. Yep. <laughs> Just but it's it. for, for the better, not for the worse, for the better. <laughs> and cool. like, yeah, this is how I try to dress now still. Like she looks so hot and I like, I get jealous of, you know, we all see those people that like, like for a while that was really in style for like a guy to wear like black skinny jeans, a white t-shirt and like white sneakers. The guys yeah. that looked like, ultra hot in it i hated because like <laughs> you have to look a certain way to be hot in such a basic outfit well you also have to be a scarecrow you have to be six foot three and 150 pounds to really right. make that look good yeah one of those yeah. scary new york fashion bodies where it's like are you wearing toilet paper god you look good <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but like she looks so hot you're right tim and just like she's just wearing jeans she's got the studded belt and a black tank top and her hair she's got great hair mm-hmm. Ugh, she looks great um so that's my favorite look uh favorite scene ryan uh hands down it's the mayor and faith having a little rap sesh where he turns his chair around puts on his backwards cap and says like let me tell you how it is gal and she's like i choose my own destiny loved it (laughs) loved it Uh, kirsten um you know i love the cut scene where uh spike is holding buffy and and he just kind of puts the most gentle kiss on top of her head like i love the tenderness i love the intimacy I love how earned it feels. Yeah. Uh, Tim? I loved the sex scene between Andrew and Spike. <laughs> oh, wait, sorry. No, I, I imagine that. That didn't actually happen. No, I uh, I, I, I was For actually going to say uh, the Faith and Mayer scene, but, uh, but since Ryan said it, I'll say my second favorite one, which was Faith sort of becoming the leader in the beginning and also telling Kennedy to back the hell off. I love that moment. That was just <laughs> such a great, great character moment. Um, 
I, my favorite scene is the Spike Buffy scene when he gives her that speech. Mm-hmm. I like still the fact that I can still like shed a few tears almost mm. 20 years later says a lot about the show and both of them are acting the hell out of it. And Ryan, you're right. They gave, they gave Sam, they gave SMG like a little t- the break. They're like, you can lay down on the scene. You don't have to love <laughs> me too much. And like, she's still acting. Hey, she's still selling. <laughs> you want to lay down? <laughs> <laughs> but like, she's still selling it on like her looks, like just like the looks she's yeah. giving him. Um, yeah. And James Marsters is like so good in that scene. Um, so good. Yeah. Uh, what grade do we give the episode, Kirsten? You know what? I'm I'm harsh on a lot of season seven. I think it has a ton of pacing issues, but this 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 avalanche toward the end always works for me. I love this episode. I give it an A plus. Nice, nice. Uh, Tim, what what grade do you give it? Oh God, I feel terrible saying this. I'm actually going to give it a C, which is a oh. gentleman's average because <laughs> I feel like. It there are some cool moments like Anya was delightful and her kitchen scene with Xander and Andrew's mind meld with the bringer was really cool. But for me, ultimately, the episode felt like a lot of disjointed events and it didn't feel like an episode. Like it didn't feel like like the whole idea of them kicking out Buffy was the inciting incident happened in the episode before. And then it kind of brought us almost to a climax and then stopped the episode before we get to like the explosion of the bomb and, you know, what happens when she picks up the scythe and everything. So it it almost didn't feel like a full episode to me. It felt like more like what we would see on streaming today where the episodes are not Mm self-contained. So, and, and, you know, a C is still average. It's not an F. It's just not an F. (laughs) I'm going to give it a C. Ryan? I would say that it is very difficult to grade this episode because it has a lot to do and has a lot of pieces that need to be put in positions for later episodes and has to pull pieces from positions that they were in in past episodes. And emotionally, there's a lot of heavy lifting to do. So ultimately, I would give it an A-, minus, if only because it felt a little rushed and yet... And yet they managed to come up with a lot of fixes for what they had to rush for budgetary constraints for yeah. uh, just logistics. Mm-hmm. It, it felt like they managed to pull together something where you didn't even really notice as much. Um, so I have to give it a high grade. But of course, it's not perfect because, it, you know, if they had had unlimited budget, unlimited time, it would have been a better episode. Right. But I, I mean, it's still an excellent episode of television that, yes, I can still cry to. And yes, has some very touching moments. And 100%, I mean, if they hadn't cut that spike in Andrew sex scene, we'd be talking A+. So. <laughs> I will agree. And I do want to say I'm grading on a steep curve because a C course, average yeah. episode of Buffy is still head and right. shoulders above oh, yeah. most yeah. other episodes of other shows. It's so, true. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I'm, I'm going to give it an A um, because I think... Uh, Kirsten or Ryan, one of you said the avalanche, they like do well. The avalanche works here. It doesn't always work. A lot of the leading up to the end episodes did feel a little bit like <sighs> we're doing some tedious, uh, like character character movements like mm-hmm. this character's got to move to that point so they're just moving in this episode and it you know like first date we're doing a lot of things uh the killer and me we're doing a lot of like where like even the the like episode title doesn't quite relate to the plot like mm-hmm. okay that's like the c plot in the episode is the episode title but then we have like the a and b plots which are just moving the pieces to get to the finale and for me it all worked here for me yes we are moving the, but the pieces are moved enough that like it makes sense and it does feel a little i agree with you ryan that like this it does they're they're bingeable these last five all are like one continuous after the other and they work better as a whole but i think this as a single piece works really well as well because like you still have your beginning middle and end of the episode um yeah i just really liked it and i love i love this is my favorite spike and buffy moment that we get in the series um and i love that it's this like they're just cuddling. He's just telling her how great she is and then they cuddle. Like there's not, mm. you know, like, oh, of course I love the like ridiculous rough sex breaking down a house. Who doesn't want to do that? But like, <laughs> you know, I, I like, like no, that. Just tell me I'm great and cuddle me. We're good. <laughs> 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 but like, but yes, as, as I approach 40, I am like, I would prefer this over <laughs> superhero sex. Because well, this I is nicer and the cleanup eight. isn't as bad. <laughs> I still want, I still want the house destruction. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, well, 
Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Tim, for being our uh, final Buffy origin storyteller. Thank you. You know, I've been wanting to come on your podcast for so long. So this is a dream come <laughs> true. Thank you so much for having me. Th- that is very nice to hear. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you liked SlayerFest 98, you can find us at SlayerFestX98 on all social media platforms. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and find us on Facebook. And if you would like to subscribe to the podcast, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube, and Podbean, anywhere else you get your podcasts, please subscribe and give us a good rating. It helps the podcast. And if you want to help us out, you can subscribe to our Patreon, uh, where we release four to five bonus episodes a month. Uh, we have our My Nudie Judy Sex Talk uh, video series that uh, I do with Zachary Patton Garcia. And uh, we're currently going through What If and uh, get about to start Harley Quinn Season 2 over at the Patreon and if you want to follow me, I am at Ian X Carlos on all social media platforms. Kirsten, where can everyone find you? Hi, you can find me on the shelves of your local bookstore. You can also find me on Twitter at, at Kirsten White or Instagram at, at author Kirsten White or KirstenWhite.com. And Ryan, where can everyone find you? Please go to at Ryan Houlihan on all your social media platforms and give him a file. He seems like a nice guy and he st- doesn't got a lot going on right now. So. <laughs> He's a pretty great guy. Uh, Tim, where can everyone find you and where can they find your uh, new series? You can find me personally uh, at, at Tim O'Leary online on all of the socials. And uh, for my very Buffy inspired queer horror comedy action show, Demon Hunter, you can find us at Demon Hunter Show on Twitter and Facebook and at Demon Hunter Series on Instagram because I like to make things difficult. And you can also <laughs> find us at demonhunter.com. And I do want to point out that it is spelled D E M O N H U N T R without the last E because there's an app in the show similar to Grinder. We take out the last E because we're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> love, love. <laughs> love that. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time. We've got two episodes of Buffy left. Uh, bye. Woo! Yay.